Democrat Dave Loebsack says it's time to retire from Congress. The Quad Cities wants you to take a seat at the table, and Mr. Scott wants your kids to get more out of Earth Day in the cities. He upset the political world of eastern Iowa in 2006 when he defeated 15-term Republican Congressman Jim Leach. Since then, Cornell College political science professor turned Iowa Congressman Dave Loebsack has represented constituents in the Iowa Quad Cities, Iowa City, Clinton, Burlington, and Ottumwa. He joined us to talk about why he has decided to leave Congress after all these years. Representative Dave Loebsack. You've just announced that you're going to retire at the end of uh, this session. Any particular reason that was the straw? Well, not necessarily, although I you know, did talk to my family about it, my wife, my two daughters, and uh, uh, they were they're ready for me to, to, to finish this job. Uh, I've still got 20, 20 months, so you're going to be seeing a lot of me between now and January 2021. Uh, but uh, as I said in the statement that I put out, uh, that, I, that I wrote, uh, thinking about all this. Um, I was not going to go more than 12 years when I first got elected. Uh, you may recall, I'm not in favor of term limits. I don't think they're necessary, and I think they can actually hurt what a person is able to accomplish. Um, but I've always thought that if there were term limits, 12 years made a lot of sense. So I wasn't going to go again the last time. Uh, and then with Donald Trump getting elected as president and seeing the things that he's been doing to our country. Um, as I said in my statement, uh, I thought that I had to run again and try to be in another two years to put a check on him and uh, his worst impulses. Uh, so that's why I plan to serve this term. And uh, after that, um, I'm hopeful that uh, we'll be able to get somebody else as president. And I think we can get somebody really good to take my place, too. Let's be honest, you're an improbable congressman. You weren't supposed to win. That's right. You know, Jim Leach was uh, a legend in uh, eastern Iowa. You beat him, showing that all things are possible, Right. Um, that incumbents can lose. What, what would you say to the person who may run in, in, in your shoes? Well, you know, and, and actually just, you know, I voted for Jim Leach a number of times myself before I ran against him. I thought he was really a good congressman. I thought that he's, he's a really good man. I uh, had him in class a number of times, but I thought it was the time to move on and to get a Democrat in that, that, that spot at that time. Um, what, I am, what I'm talking to folks about and what I've said all along is that uh, to be an effective congressman and really to, or congresswoman, whatever the case may be, to represent your district well, you have to go to all those counties all the time. You have to go there where, as I like to say, to borrow a phrase from the disabilities community, where people live, work, and play. And so, you know, even on Sundays, if I would go to the mall, you know, Coral Ridge Mall, um, I would either hang out at the food court, I'd do some shopping, but, but I'd hang out at the food court, or I'd go to the Barnes and Noble and, you know, get a cookie and, and coffee. And people come by and I talk to them and they tell me what's on their mind. Uh, uh, that's kind of a, a, a less formal town hall, if you will, in that sense. But I also have done 20 coffees with your congressman this year already, and I'm going to continue those. I want to hear what people have to say. I'm still going to be in another 20 months, and we're going to be voting on legislation. I'm on the Energy and Commerce Committee. We're still going to be doing good things on that committee. Uh, so I want to you know, continue the, the role that I, that I played up to this point. But it's just getting out and talking to people and hearing what they have to say and asking what they think about the issues and then doing the best you can when you go back. It's a diverse district. You're not going to please everybody. Uh, but uh, you do the best you can to represent as many people as you possibly can. What are you going to miss about the job? You know, I'm going to miss a lot of my colleagues, and, and people think of uh, Washington, D.C. as a swamp, and it is in many ways. But, uh, you know, I've got a lot of friends on both sides of the aisle, and I've got plenty of time to say goodbye, plenty of time to talk to them. Uh, the only thing is I don't, I don't want to start a trend or something. You don't have <laughs> other members uh, of my party decide they're going to do the same thing. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, but I've been talking to some of them about this, you know, for, for a while uh, as well. Uh, but I'm going to miss them. But I'm going to miss getting out into the district, uh, quite honestly, and just meeting people and, uh, you know, going to the easy places to go to as a Democrat and going to the hard places to go to as a, as a Democrat, where you know you're not going to have a lot of friends when you go there. But, um, 
you know, I taught at a college and uh, I, I enjoy the, the argumentation and the challenge and I enjoy meeting people who don't agree with me. Let me ask you about the Democratic Party that's in the House right now. Yeah. Some might say it's going very far to the left, almost radical, radicalized. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about the face of the party right now? Um, and do you think Speaker Pelosi has got a handle on it? I think she's doing a fantastic job, to be totally honest. Um, she said something uh, the other day that, that I had been saying, actually, for quite some time. Uh, she was in an interview, and she said, this glass, you could put a D on this glass, and it could win in the districts from the people you're talking about. Uh, and that's true. That wouldn't happen in this district. This is a competitive district. Well, and I was going to say, Donald Trump won not only this district, but also Sherry Bustos' that's district, right. this entire area. Yeah, he won this one by 4.1. He won hers by, by, by less than a percent. And uh, these are competitive districts. There's no question about that. And, and I do believe that Nancy Pelosi's been navigating that really well. I think she's been doing a good job as speaker. I had my concerns beforehand, and, and she knew that. Um, but I think she's done a good job. I think she is, is, is doing a good job negotiating with Donald Trump and, and not putting up with, with uh, his excesses, if you will. I see that he's coming after her now, so he must, must be concerned about how things are going. But no, not every district is the same. And some of the folks you know that you're talking about, some of the new members, you know, they live in their districts and I live in my district and I don't claim to understand their districts. I don't want them to understand mine. And, and least of all, do I want them to think that, that somehow every Democrat has to run on those particular issues as they stand on those issues. That's true, but on the national stage, especially when we're heading into 2020 with a presidential election, if the Democratic brand seems to be far left, more progressive, radicalized, if some might say, does that not hurt chances in 2020 for districts like this as well as for the presidency? Well, that's, that's, that's possible. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that what you're going to see, whoever takes my place on the Democratic side, will run his or her campaign based on the district, as I did all those times. You know, Trump won, President Trump won my district by 4.1 percent. That year I won it by 7.5 percent. And I, and I didn't advertise on TV. I could have done, you know, even more in that sense, quite honestly. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, anyone who takes my place and runs as a Democrat has a tremendous opportunity to hold the seat. It is competitive. It is a toss-up. But I think that that, that that person definitely has a great chance to win. There's no doubt about it. And if I have anything to say about it, that person will win. Looking back at, at your career in Washington right now, I mean, you're known by your friends as well as your enemies. You get a 0% from some of the conservative taxpayer right. alliances as well as the, uh, the uh, pro-life groups. You get 100% through some environmental groups. You voted with the Democrats about 90% of the time. Right. Were you a true bipartisan congressman or were you more of a Democratic congressman? That's a great question, Jim. Um, when you talk about my voting record 90 percent of the time uh, with the Democrats, that's true. Uh, if you look at the bills that I put my name on, about 40 or so percent of those bills are actually originated by a Republican. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not joking when I say what I'm going to say. And that is, if Paul Ryan had actually put the bills on the floor that got bipartisan support, then you would have seen a lot of us Democrats on those statistics that you're talking about voting much less with the Democratic Party. Because, you know, a lot of us work with the Republicans on a regular basis because our districts demand that we do that, and it's the right thing to do. But when Republicans were in control and they put bills on the floor, those bills were not compromise bills. That was the problem I had with those bills. And I talked to Paul Ryan and all those folks about that all the time. But, uh, you know, they, they had their, their Tea Party faction. They wanted them to be as, as far to the right as possible. And that wasn't right for my district as far as I was concerned. But when they put the bills on the floor that I put my name on, co-sponsored, or that I originated and had a Republican on, those bills passed, and I was happy to vote, uh, obviously. Uh, if that was a Republican vote, so be it. It was the right thing for my district, the right thing for Iowa, and I think the right thing for America. That's something that's happened in the House for so many years that almost gotcha bills right. start springing All up so that time. you have it on your record and people can run against Both you. Both sides do it. Exactly, and that was going to be my point. Then the Senate was supposed to be more deliberative. Some can argue that that's not occurring right now either. Is this something that we can just expect more of and it just is becoming more bitter because as soon as one party gets in power, they want to get some uh, 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 chips paid? Yeah, no, I think that the, that happens with both parties. And now what we're seeing uh, with the Republicans in the minority is they have what they call these motions to recommit. And these are, these are, these are, these are uh, uh, motions, a uh, piece of legislation that really are meaningless. I mean, truly, they are. They are, they are procedural votes, and they really don't make any difference. 
uh, but they're designed to trap Democrats you know, in districts like this. If they vote the wrong way on that motion to recommit, then there could potentially be a commercial run against them because of that particular vote. Even though the vote didn't mean anything, it was a procedural vote, uh, not a substantive vote in that sense. And both sides do that, unfortunately. Uh, as you said, to try to trap the other side run a commercial against them, defeat them in the next election. I've talked a lot about politics, but I wanted to talk about one thing that whenever you come to the cities, yeah. you always have to talk about, and that's Arsenal Island. Yeah. Uh, uh, you have been, uh, you, and that's bipartisan in the uh, Iowa and Illinois delegations, is to make sure that uh, Arsenal Island remains productive and in essence exists. How, how, how confident are you right now in the stability at Arsenal Island? Oh, I feel pretty good about it actually, and because we do have that, that unity uh, that bi-state unity in our delegations. Um, I think everybody around here understands the importance of it. Uh, I'm still going to co-chair you know, the caucus that deals with, with, with arsenals and depots and what have you. We're going to have a meeting in, in July on this, uh, or in June on this. Uh, so I'm going to continue to advocate as much as I can. Uh, uh, the people who are now in charge of the Armed Services Committee are Democrats, and I you know, go pretty far back now with some of those folks, and I'm going to continue to press the issue with them. Uh, I feel pretty confident that we're not going to have a BRAC anytime soon, and that's really important. Uh, and so we'll continue on that front and on the workload front as well. Sherry and I have done a number of things. Sherry Bustos and I have done a number of things on that front. We're going to continue to do that as well. So, no, I'm pretty confident that we're going to be able to, to, to work really hard and uh, maintain, if you will, you know, the posture and, and the importance of the Rock Island Arsenal moving forward, and not just at the Joint Manufacturing Technology Center, but also the commands that are there, the first First Army and all the rest. Those are really important, as you know. And I didn't mention, you know, we got to keep helping our veterans. That is not unconnected to the Rock Island Arsenal, obviously, because we're talking about folks who've been in the military willing to lay down their lives for us, essentially. Uh, and so we've got to keep helping them as well, and that's something I'm going to continue with. That was Congressman Dave Loebzag, Democrat of the 2nd District of Iowa. In a moment, voicing your opinions at the big table. But first, Laura Adams, out and about. This is Out and About for April 15th through 21st. Be in the audience for Rain, a tribute to the Beatles at the Tax Slayer Center on April 24th. WQPT has a limited number of tickets in Section 104 available for your pledge of $125. You'll receive two tickets and enjoy the sounds of the Beatles as only Rain can present. Join an Earth Day celebration at the Freight House Farmer's Market April 20th starting at 9 a.m. There's activities for the whole family. Or register for the 10th annual Donna Phillips 5K Run Dog Walk on April 13th in Macomb. Join the Niobe Zoo for Brunch with the Bunny, a fully catered brunch and meet the Easter Bunny in the Spring Meadow on the 21st. The Professional Women's Network of the Sauk Valley Chamber is hosting a Lunch and Learn on April 17th. Women in Retirement, Living Longer and Financially Stronger. Or delve into George Orwell's dystopian novel 1984 in three Blackhawk College seminars this April held at the BHC Outreach Center in East Moline. There's still time to catch the Louis Comfort Tiffany Treasures from the Dry House Collection at the Figgy Art Museum. Plus, Recycle the Runway is being held at the River Center April 18th to support Dress for Success Quad Cities. And don't miss the laugh out loud story of family, friendship, love, and romance in a fresh musical that's guaranteed to delight as Circa 21 presents Grumpy Old Men. For more information, visit wqpt.org. Thank you, Laura. It was an experiment in civic discourse. Last year, hundreds of people, actually thousands, gathered at a number of locations to talk about their community, their concerns, and their pride. It was called the Big Table, part of the Quad City Chamber of Commerce's Q2030 initiative to make the city stronger. And the Big Table is returning next Friday and Saturday, April 26th and 27th. And joining us is the director of Q2030, Greg Aguilar. Thanks so much for joining us. It was a success last time, now you want to build on it, or why are we doing it again? It was a huge success last year because it created a new tool for the community to come together and talk about what's on their mind, and especially share ideas on how we can make it better. Last year, we had over 5,000 participate in the Quad Cities Big Table, and we sent out a survey, and well over 1,700 people responded. So we took those results and we picked the five top conversations that were had at the Big Table, and this year we decided to have five major big tables, and of course still encourage everyday quad citizens to host their own. 
but it, we wanted to ensure that Quad Citizens knew that they were heard and that these ideas weren't just let go. We're actually going to double down, bring these conversations to a larger group so that we can tackle some of these t conversations together. Well, the first one is coming up next Friday at Western Illinois University, 8.30 in the morning. You're getting up that early to talk about what? Entrepreneurial ecosystems. Which is so incredibly important for the future of this area. Well, you know, it's important because we need innovation, we need new ideas, we need to create new jobs, but we also need to ensure that we have an inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem that looks at all aspects of life that might have an opportunity to create their own business. So we want to bring leaders from SCORE, uh, SBDC, mm -hmm. organizations that can help small businesses develop and grow here in the Quad Cities. Now a lot of people would say, oh this is a Chamber of Commerce event, it's just for white collar people. But I mean you've got other issues going on. You're talking about the Quad Cities being a destination spot. You're talking about the importance of housing in the Quad Cities as well. There's different topics that Let's be honest, 80% of the citizens are going to be affected by one, if not all of them. You're right, and Q2030 is changing the game in the Quad Cities where, of course, it includes our business leaders, our elected leaders, but the big table opened it up to everyday Quad Citizens because we are better together and we have to work together. We need to change the way sometimes leadership has been done where someone might have an idea and just assumes that everyone is gonna follow along with it. Kind of a top-down management style. Correct, and that doesn't work. What people want to do is they want to be engaged, they want to be heard, and they want to work with leaders to get what they want done, especially with attracting and retaining talent and building an awesome destination. Uh, for example, the one that's gonna be at the Quad Cities destination experience, which is gonna be at the Rust Belt. You know, what is our brand? Who are we? How do we share our story? What is our story? Let's talk about it so we can come up with it together and share that. The big thing I know that you want is that you make sure that uh, people who live in the Quad Cities aren't just citizens, but they're stakeholders as well. And that's what you're really targeting is that, hey, you guys have a say in this. This is your time to voice. Well, your time's all the time, but this is a great opportunity to voice it. Sure, I think if you're if you're from the Quad Cities, you're, you're a Quad City, and you know, I think everyone from here is a Quad City. And with Quad Citizens, it's people who are from the Quad Cities who live here, call it home, but are putting in a little bit extra, trying to make it better. And that's what we want to do is empower Quad Citizens to make it better. And the big table, it's. What's neat about this format is, although it's becoming a new tradition in the Quad Cities, we don't have to wait till April. There are people who have had big tables before or after because it's creating an inclusive table of conversation with people who want to help. And it's just the way we're going to get things done in the future by having inclusive tables of conversation. You know this as well as anyone else. People can talk a lot of hot air. The action is what they want to see. And some people might say, why do I want to expend any time discussing something when it's just going to end up in a binder as a report? Sure. This this year is different with the Quad Cities Big Table for various reasons, but one thing that's new is people who participate at the big table, when they sign in, they'll also have an opportunity to check a box if they want to start participating in a work group, if they want to maybe champion a work group that doesn't exist. And also, it'll open up the steering committee so that they can have an influence on the direction of our region. And that's important for us with Q2030, again, because we need a grassroots, bottom-up movement to change the way people in the Quad Cities think, speak, and behave, and so that we can work to be globally recognized by the year 2030 for attracting and retaining top talent and business. Because the big thing is that the Quad Cities is in competition with so many other small urban centers to grow. And if you're not thinking ahead, I believe that's what the point of Q2030 is, if you're not planning for the next decade, it's going to go past you. Sure, site selectors, when they're looking for new places to put a business, they're asking about the workforce, they're asking about population, they're looking at wages, they're looking at is, is your GDP rising, they're also looking at poverty. And these are issues that we have to tackle as a community. You know, one that makes me, uh, it sticks out in my mind with, with poverty and affordable housing. By creating affordable housing, people have an opportunity to build wealth and leverage that wealth so they can pursue higher education or a trade or whatever it is that they want to do. But unless we have equitable opportunities for that, we're going to see our poverty gaps grow. And that's one of the main goals of Q2030 is fighting that poverty gap. And fighting the fact that people don't think they can improve their lot in life or their community. So speaking up and listening is going to be critical. Yeah, because when people are listened to and they feel engaged, they're more likely to stay. And we want to attract and, of course, retain that talent. And we often see regions, and we're also looking at it the same way, where we want to attract talent, but one of the best ways to have talent and develop talent is to retain the talent that's already here. 
part of that is listening to young people. So for the second year in a row, uh, with the help of our community collaboration group and John Deere, they hosted the Student Big Table. I did notice that. I was earlier this year and a genius idea. Thank you. And what was neat was it was 15 different schools, 60 different students, various ages, uh, very diverse group. And the two ideas that they said that they want to see for the community, one was an engagement strategy where young people can engage and help the community. And their idea was very similar to the student hunger drive where they're raising food, mm -hmm. uh, or they're trying to raise money and they're trying to uh, help with food. They want to do it with clothing. They took a similar idea that happened in Rock Island to try to find clothing for young people. Mm -hmm. the, the idea was maybe we can do a clothing drive and we have schools compete with each other. The second idea that did very well is they want a QC, Quad Cities Teen Spirit Night. They suggested going to Modern Woodman Park to watch the River Bandits play, but invite area high schools so that they can network and meet students from other schools. Because they want something to do and they want to engage with other high school students. But again, going back to retaining that talent, if we're listening to them and we're working with them, we're more likely to retain them. A cooperative community becomes a healthier community. Absolutely. Greg Aguilar is the director of Q2030. Thank you so much for joining us. And once again, the Quad Cities Big Table 2019 kicks off Friday morning at Western Illinois University Quad Cities. Other Friday sessions are at the Rust Belt in East Moline and the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center in Rock Island. Saturday sessions are scheduled for the Bettendorf Public Library and Modern Woodman Park. Keith Soko is a singer and songwriter in the cities who says his style is influenced by the music of Elvis Presley and Muddy Waters. We caught up with him as he took the stage in downtown Moline's Black Box Theater. Here's Keith Soko with Breaks Like China. I was bad, I was mean. I was the only guy who could make the whole scene on my own I was bigger, I was strong I didn't need anybody till she came along on her own But she walks out of my life and my heart breaks like China like China, oh, breaks like. She said I didn't care, didn't listen, and when I did, I didn't hear her at all. Didn't see any signs. Things were falling apart, but I must have been blind to them all. But she walks out of my life and my heart breaks like China. Oh, breaks like China. Oh, breaks like say goodbye and I really do need her but I'm not gonna cry but there's some kind of feeling burning deep in my soul and I don't want to ever let her go Circumstance I've left too much to chance. I'm alone. Was she right? Was I wrong? Well, I don't know, but if I don't move quick, she'll be gone and alone. But she walks out of my life, and my heart breaks like China. Oh, breaks like China. Keith Soko with Breaks Like China. 
Earth Day was created in 1970 as the nation started to turn its eyes toward the dirty air and polluted rivers and lakes across America. Now it marks almost 50 years of environmental awareness and throughout the month WQPT is marking Earth Day with special coverage including things you can do with your children and joining us is Mr. Scott host of WQPT's Exploring with Mr. Scott. How are you sir? I'm great. How are you? I'm fine. This is a great time. Uh, well, let me back up a second. When it comes to Earth Day and environmental awareness the kids seem to have led it. I mean, oh. I remember Earth Day activities, the very first one in 1970, I remember that. And the whole concept was, take this back to your folks. Definitely, definitely. And I, I, and I, I truly believe that the earlier and the younger that we can get children to explore and embrace nature, the harder it is later on in life mm -hmm. to destroy it. Oh, a very good point. And plus, I mean, they're such great advocates. Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. What have you been doing this month? Because I know that you've revisited some of the programs that you've done in the past. I mean, how have you tried to get kids involved and more aware of the environment? Uh, and it's something that we try to do all year. But, but this month, um, we're doing more um, Earth Day celebrations. Um, uh, we'll have a table at uh, Earth Day celebration this weekend, um, just building with um, nature doing sculptures with nature. And um, I'm at several schools that I'm doing a whole month long um, Earth Day um, activities. I've done, uh, we're doing stuff with um, animal homes. So getting children to learn about where, where animals live and how they build their homes, just like we do. Mm -hmm. You can keep reaching the kids, but you really want to also reach the parents. I mean, it, it, you seem to really want to make sure that whenever there's an activity, it's not just kid only. Right, right. I want the parents involved in that. And the whole idea of the Let's Explore with Mr. Scott is to show parents that it's easy to get out there and do things with your kids outside. And you don't have to have all this elaborate equipment. You don't have to have technology. In fact, I'm like, I'm definitely <laughs> non-technology yeah. when getting out and exploring. Well, but just keep it simple. Right, right. Keep it simple. And, and that, that helps parents realize that we don't have to prepare. We don't have to have a big, you know, big to do to get ready to go outside. We can just explore. Yeah, you don't have to buy expensive equipment either. Right, Yeah. no. So, so how, if a parent is thinking, you know what, I'd like to do something like that. I mean, the, the website's a good resource. You have your past programs uh, mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube and elsewhere. I mean, how does someone get some good ideas that you've already provided? Um, I, on our website, we do actually have an exploration kit that parents can put together with their kids. And it is, it, it, it literally is just things you have at home. Um, Tupperware containers that have that have separate areas in there, so children can sort nature items. Um, tongs that you might use for ice or for pasta to help pick up things that they might find in nature. Um, just regular strainers to to sift through sand and find fossils. All things that you have at home and can use to explore. Yeah, because if you explore and you learn a little bit about what you're exploring. I would assume your belief is then you'll respect definitely. Mother Nature a little bit more. Definitely, definitely. And, and like I said, if, if, if children can embrace nature and learn about nature, they're going to love nature. There, there's no doubt that they're not going to love nature. Let's talk about this time of year because there's two mm -hmm. events that are going on. One, of course, is the beginning of spring. Right. There's so much that you can learn. The other one is the Mississippi River flooding and the flooded rivers and creeks all Definitely. throughout the area. Let me start with spring. This seems to be the best time, at least, to get out and do a little exploring oh, yes, and yes. see the transition between two very radically different seasons. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And, and one of the big things we want to promote um, for children and their parents is to get out there in the spring, too, and clean up. Mm -hmm. Because over the winter, as we all know, the wind blows paper around right. and plastic and we want to get out there and clean up nature and help help uh, children learn that uh, we have to keep the environment clean to, to be safe for animals and for us and for the plants. Which was an underlying feature of the creation of Earth Day. The other thing is that this is a good time to learn about flooding in the ecosystem as well, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and we want, we want children and parents to be safe, but we also want them to know that flooding is a natural thing. And it does happen, and actually it is, it is good for our environment, but you, we do want to show uh, you know, them that we can protect property that we have built up. Mr. Scott, exploring with Mr. Scott, you can see it throughout the day on WQPT, particularly during the children programming mm -hmm. yes. on, the, on the public TV station. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Get some great ideas. Check it out at the WQPT webpage for more ways to share some time with your kids as they explore the world around them. Thank you, Mr. Scott.
And once again, we invite you to take part in the Big Table Community Discussion. It kicks off Friday morning at Western Illinois University Quad Cities. Other Friday sessions are at the Rust Belt in East Moline and the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Center in Rock Island. Saturday sessions are scheduled for the Bettendorf Public Library and Modern Woodman Park. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities.